All right. <clears throat> well, it's midday, so it's time for Little Lunch Online. And this is number 30. So I'd like to have a, give a big congratulations to Norm and Sarah and Elliot for producing these daily conversation events. What an epic, uh, you know, feat to pull off. So thanks, guys. It's been great. So we're here to talk about uh, theatre for 10, anyone? And before we go into that, I'd like to acknowledge the land on which I stand, which is Yagara country, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now, welcome, everyone. It's Monday. If you haven't done a little lunch online, just a few little housekeepings, uh, turn your mic off. This is being recorded and it will, it's going live to YouTube and it will go be uploaded later. And I think it's live to the, <laughs> to the uh, Little Lunch Online Arts Front um, website. Also, if you want the Auslan interpreter, you can pin them to your page. And we also have a fantastic um, artists who are doing the captioning here today. So thanks everyone who's involved. It's a big production and we're going to have a great chat because I have some fantastic guests and we are talking about the fact that the National Cabinet has now said, yes, this is stage one, which means we can now have 10 people in a public space. So 10 people in a restaurant, 10 people in a bar, you can train down the park with 10 people. So does this mean we can finally go back to the theatre. Amongst this question, I'll also be talking to our fabulous guests around what I've been doing lots of talking to people working in the industries. And what's been interesting is what weaknesses and strengths have been revealed within the creative sector industry as a whole and in individual arts practices and organisations. So I'll be talking to our guests about that as a way to imagine what the future potentially could look like as we hopefully can emerge from this insane time. So that's enough from me. I'd like to big round of applause and um, welcome Zohar Spatz, who is the Executive Director of Le Bois. Hey, Zohar, how are you? Hey, Beck. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. It's my first little lunch. Loving it. It's lovely to see you in your winter woolies, looking fab. <laughs> <laughs> I'm freezing. <laughs> and I have um, David Sleswick, or Dave Sleswick, who is the creative de director of The Triffid. How are you, Dave? Trivoli. <laughs> oh, what I say? The Triffid. Oh, my God. Ah! I would be equally proud to be that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Lucky I didn't say you're from Queensland Theatre, Zoha. Oh. No. Okay, let's do that again. Dave Sleswick from the Tivoli. Hey. Hey. Thank you for having me also. Very happy to be here. Fantastic. Now, before we get into the big question, can you please um, just briefly outline where your organisation is right now within the programming for 2020 and the, and the work you're doing with the artists, maybe the repurposing of funds? Like, I know it's been a really rapid turnaround, but... Um, uh, there's been some recent announcements made from particularly Le Bois around where you are right now. Zoha, could you just give us a brief fill in on, on what's happening? Sure, absolutely. So um, we are in the seventh week of our, of our team working remotely. So um, towards that end of March, we all stepped out and closed, closed the building and the offices and all stepped away and started working from home. Um, and then we went through the pretty painful, um, very intense period of constantly revisiting where the company was at as the government was um, very rapidly making announcements about um, different kind of support mechanisms, not just the AQ government, but federal government. Um, and we got to a place where for the company to um, kind of ensure that it continues to make theatre for the next 95 years. We went through the very painful um, but necessary uh, process of cancelling the rest of our 2020 season. So our main stage program, for those of you that weren't aware, it was only programmed up till S September um, and two of those works were touring works and it was becoming pretty clear that uh, travelling across borders was going to be pretty difficult. Um, so we decided to take um, decisive decision making in our hands and with the support of our board, um, tried to as humanely as possible cancel our season. So spent a lot of time video conferencing with artists, 
um, and companies, but also reaching out to artists and companies that we have relationships with and have been working with us over the last two years in a focused way and sort of checked in with them to see what we could do for them over this period, not knowing what capacity we would have, but how we might support them. So the first step was obviously making those cancellations. Um, and throughout this process, we've been touching base with artists and companies, not just those that we're in development with. So we have companies that work with us as artists in residence um, or our highway artists. Um, so for example, the other week and over the last couple of weeks, our finance manager was doing one hour sessions with a bunch of artists to see how we could support them with the JobKeeper scheme. Um, and uh, just reaching out to see how we can support people with letters of support or even reviewing funding applications. So we've been doing our best to support people administratively and now we are, like many, doing about four different versions of what the end of the year could be. So um, obviously these recent announcements from the federal government give us some form of clarity. But I think it would be pretty naive of all of us to think that Theatre for 10 or Theatre for 100 is really going to create that impact that we need with respect to um, fiscally, financially supporting artists and also creating an outlet or a pathway for an audience member to yeah. come in and see a work. So um, I think it's possible and it's amazing to be able to think outside the box. But um Theatre and, and performance, um, you know, in how we currently make it, which may be part of why the system's broken, is an expensive venture and we're not um, subsidised or valued enough from the government at this point um, to be able to sort of create a way that we could give the product we usually would for 100 or for 10. So, yeah. And I totally understand that you're making decisions on the run in the middle of a continually moving, evolving health crisis. So um, I can imagine it's very, very complex. What about you, Dave? We Last time we spoke over Zoom, uh, Triff, the Tivoli, God, what is wrong with me this morning? It's Monday. The Tivoli was rapidly um, coming up with a solution. You were going to do a live stream of Sahara Beck from the Tivoli within the decision of making that it got cut down to us all in our lounge rooms doing it over Zoom. What, what since I've talked to you have, where, where is the Tivoli at right now with its program for 2020? Um, very similar position to Le Bois. We first heard the kind of the 500 rule implementation get announced um, on the 13th of March. And a couple of days before that, we started seeing a few of our shows start to drop away and then on that 13th of march we literally lost four or five months of of programming and we we do roughly around 20 events a month uh 20 different events a month and um so we just dropped up drop 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 um um pretty painstakingly day by day just losing more and more and more um and so by the time we hit we did our last event on the 15th of march uh, where we had to split a show of a thousand people into two shows of 500 people. And then the following day it was cut down to um, hundred and then basically everything shut down. So um, the tricky thing for us is our timelining around kind of the music and performing arts industry. When you're kind of, when you announce a show, when tickets go on sale, when a marketing campaign begins. And the reality is, is that our venues are 1500 capacity space and we're not going to, no one is in, in a position where they feel comfortable about announcing any shows, any new shows, kind of for the rest of the year because people don't know if they're actually going to happen or not. So um, we have now been, like Zoha, we've got a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, mm -hmm. and day by day each of those plans change and it actually is becoming um, a real emotionally exhausting process to go what happens when all four of your plans <laughs> all need to be readjusted kind of day by day um, and so based on the new information that's come out theater for 10 theater for 100 we're going we're trying to think about all the things that we can do rather than all the things that we can't and um, 
trying to inject a sense of positivity back into our mindset that maybe there's a way of being creative and doing things in a new way that can help potentially help us positively long term to kind of have that nimble mindset um yeah but really to be honest i don't have anything planned to go out there publicly for months and months and months yeah. but we're working out now maybe what does 100 people look like yeah, yeah. and i i can hear you dave about how exhausting it is to continually have to shift the plan and how the plan impacts so many people other than yourself so i mean yeah. completely draining but so but 10, we can, can we do 10 in theatre, Zaha? You reckon that's naive? What, so is it 50, is it 100, is it 200? At what point does a live venue become a feasible possibility in relationship to finances, to the uh, experience of the artists presenting the work and to the actual audience being involved, Zaha? I reckon you can do theatre for one. Uh, you know, you can do theatre for any number of people. I think um, it's about, and I think absolutely you can do theatre for 10. I'm not suggesting it's not possible. I think it's about, like Dave said, just trying to find the space for transformative thinking, like what does theatre for 10 look like and how do you like deeply and creatively kind of find a way to make it a unique experience for our audience? I think there's... There's this real push and pull around us being creatively like excited about what we can create, but at the same time also thinking about, well, who is going to come for that experience? And if, you know, like totally boring thing to think about, but like if it is theatre for 10 and it's a pretty expensive price point, let's give that audience an experience that they would just never get usually. Let's give them something that's so bloody unique and so incredible. They'll, they'll, they'll think about that for years to come because I think there's also this real opportunity around if it is theatre for 10 or theatre for 100 performance for intimate experiences, let's do that intimate experience we've always wanted to do. Let's not try and give them that same half empty theatre space yeah. And I, I imagine for the performers, it would be uh, difficult in a way to present work to 10 people in a room, particularly if they're all spread out, like you're almost performing to a an half empty theatre. That would be, I guess, part of the challenge of this potential new way forwards so hard. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, I remember during Melbourne Festival, and I'm sorry because this is going to be a really boring story because off the top of my head I can't remember the theatre show, but it was this gorgeous work from the UK and um, you kind of sat in a booth and you watched this animation kind of happen around you or in front of you and it was an incredible theatre, in-theatre experience and it was very much my own um, and, you know, that that kind of remarkable experience that stayed with me for weeks afterwards, mm. um, I think, as you say, like, it can't be, you know, sitting in a space, particularly Le Bois, like, one of the beauties of that space is that it's quite democratic. Like, I actually, to be honest, mostly spend my time watching other people watch their experience because I, I find that so amazing because we're in the round and, it's so intimate. So what does it look like if it's gold class kind of seating where there's a chair in between each person and they've got a table with a bottle of wine and some cheese on it and they're having like this really intimate and special experience on the stage. Um, so I think in amongst us planning for A, B and C and knowing that that, that is going to change, we need to give ourselves the time and space to like blow it up and think about, well, what does this 100 experience feel like? What's the most unique an incredible gift that we can give people who haven't had the chance to have a live experience in so long. Like, all I want is to go and see a gig. I am, you know, I just want to go out. I want to be among <laughs> people. <laughs> it's killing me. I'm done. <laughs> and what about you, Dave? As you, you sort of mentioned before, there's already some creative thinking around the 10, 50, 100 people. What, what are you envisioning in this space? What am I envisaging? Well, <clears throat> um, I'm thinking about space in terms of what it looks like if restrictions lift more on open air, um, on open air spaces, and we've got a car park, whether we build outside 
and we let people gather in open air spaces. I've been talking with some local um, companies, uh, um, local organizations around that have outdoor spaces. I'm like, well, can we go and activate that? We actually have a um, large commercial kitchen on site too, and it's got caterers and people in there. So we're talking about what it looks like to do dinner, theater shows, take the Tivoli back to its roots, to its, um, you know, the old, the old um, dinner, theater, restaurant. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just, I mean, we haven't made any decisions yet, but the fact is, is that we are, um, our brains are being quite overactive at the moment in terms of not shutting anything down at this point. One of the trickiest things, um, and, you know, like Soha said, I would love to go and have some one-on-one theater experiences. I would love to, I would love to be doing things that are more intimate um, and engaged. And, but the reality is, is that not only have we lost the ability to do what we usually do, we've lost our income. And so we have to be thinking about what's financially viable. And mm. for me, one of the things that's pretty devastating is that what does it look like when we have no output, when yeah. we just when we have nothing to put out into the world? Uh, and are we dormant? <laughs> like how to, how to deal with dormancy? And um, so we've just opened a bottle shop next door with all of our existing booze, but um, to, to try and sell it. But the thing for me about that is not about making money. It's about having something to kind of keep the momentum of your organization going yeah. um, and to keep the momentum of your staff, to keep some sense of um, driving force. But when we talk about doing things on a really small scale, I just don't know how some of those things are going to be viable. Mm, yeah. You know, like, I completely agree. I mean, that, that's part of the, I guess, why you guys, it, it is such a struggle for... Um, programmers to come up with this plan and pressure to have the answers for something that keeps changing as as we've just as you've just been discussing and um and just in the bigger picture of things uh as i said earlier covid 19s offered an opportunity for um strengths and weaknesses to be revealed in organizations practices even the creative industry's relationship to the community as a whole um and therefore, there is this opportunity now to assess, reassess, rebuild. So how, what would you say from your perspective are the biggest kind of, I guess, weaknesses that have been revealed for you and the strengths? And how could you perceive how this could potentially work to create a better outcome in the future? Yeah, well, I think, I, to be fair, I think the biggest weakness that's been um, really highlighted is how fragile our sector is um, and that for so many years, be, you know, beyond how long I've been in here for so many years, um, we just keep patchworking ourselves up and everyone just keeps taking hits and hits on a personal level to the point where now we've just found ourselves realising that it comes tumbling down where there's no support mechanisms for artists and, you know, what's a theatre company without artists in that space? Um, and for me, I think that that is quite overwhelming and something that we can't forget, as well as for me, what's become really apparent is that we also, one of our biggest biggest weaknesses as a sector is that we really do not know how to articulate our value. And mm -hmm. this has been an ongoing problem for over a decade at least, but yes, okay, anytime there's a Liberal government, but certainly I think that we need to reevaluate and rethink who's speaking on our behalf. Um, I think we have a really clear understanding around how we articulate storytelling and the importance of who we are, but it's really clear that we're missing someone to help us translate it. And we're missing that translation at a federal government level where we can actually receive the funding. So a strength really is to acknowledge that that failure is there and that we can no longer go on without changing who speaks on our behalf and maybe inviting a new type of voice in to help translate for us. So that, that to me is a huge weakness, but I see a strength because there's a solution there. We can't do this like this again, and it will keep on happening. Um, I don't think this will ever change. Um, and I think really for me, one of the formative, like the really inspired thing that's come out of this though, and 
particularly, you know, I'm based in Brisbane on Yagara and Turrbal country, but I'm originally from, I grew up on Coolan country in Melbourne. Um, and I've been here now for nine years. And what a bloody amazing community. Like, you know, for me throughout all of this, whilst individually, I think we've all been suffering and having our own journey through it. I think as a sector across art form, what's been really incredible is community. And then beyond that, my local community, seeing who comes out to support local businesses, um, who's out the front of the street. And I think um, I noted, I think it was the end, you know, people talking about how do we, you know, like how do we engage art and storytelling in our local community? How do we become localised and then use that as a strength? Um, and that's not by being isolated and kind of going internally. It's more about actually in maybe before we were all inside our own small bubbles and now there's this opportunity to be within a bigger and broader community that goes beyond just our sector but certainly as a city and a state, I think it's been pretty incredible to watch how supportive we've all been of one another um, and how communicative we are all with one another in trying to excel and, and move forward. Yeah. And, um, and Dave, I, and um, all those things I totally agree with. And the chat is going hot. People have... Uh, are responding with a lot of really amazing ideas and questions. So, Dave, I might get you to quickly answer to that, and then I might throw it over to. There's a few people here who I can um I can identify, and you can have a chance opportunity to ask your questions. So, Dave, what's your response quickly about the strengths and the weaknesses that have been revealed to you? One of the weaknesses has definitely been able to, and I've known this always, but to really acknowledge how vulnerable our industry is, and how and how and how constantly vulnerable it has always been, which harpers back to Zohar's point about how to, how, to under, how to understand and articulate what we offer to the world. And um, I don't know how we can go about creating that systemic change where we're able to be more present, more valued, more understood within the greater community um, and it's got to do with advocacy, but it's also got to do with major cultural shifts um, that have just really kind of come to the surface. From a business point of view, um, I feel like uh, from, my, from my perspective, I run my business inde independently of funding, and there's very interesting challenges within that, but there's also very interesting learnings and I think there is a way that we're able to potentially learn from other industries too about how to collaborate and um, potentially find a way to scrape ourselves out of a dependent model where we're relying on other people to tell us what we can and can't do and what we can and can't achieve based on funding. Um, don't know how, but I just feel that there's a, a significant kind of area of growth to be to be gained there. Um, so I'm just going to throw to everyone now for some question time because we've only got seven minutes. We are on a tight schedule. Leanne D'Souza, I see that you've been making some um, really uh, potent comments around the relationship of community to building narratives to building to working maybe brokering a different deal with how we um, create our culture. Do you want to say, ask a question or have some something to say about this, Leanne D'Souza? Hi, Beck. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Meryls. Hi, all. Um, not particularly. I'm like everyone. I've been wrestling a lot with all of this, but I also think I kind of sit in that space, what Dave was just saying there around those that are sort of existing spaces and commercial and then also what the, the NGOs and what the value of arts and culture are, but also I've been really interrogating myself as a, music lover and an arts person and you know what how do I want to experience when I start going out where am I going to put my money what do I you know I'm trying to think more around the community and audiences because I'm not to be honest getting a lot of comfort from the leadership across the arts and culture sector nationally so I've sort of reverted <laughs> back to thinking of you know if we change individual community habits and values and then how we radiate out that so I've got no questions I'm just soaking it all up 
I've got, um, more, I've got zillion questions. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to give you your own show. Um, <laughs> uh, Bong Ramello, you're, you're making some really, um, really interesting points. So do you want to quickly say something or ask a question? Hi, good morning. No, not really. It's just um, just suggesting we look at the experience of community-based theatre, uh, which over the years has have had theatre for one, ten, a hundred or thousands of people, and it's not not always tied to black boxes or um, box office. It's a different way to to make theatre, which to me um, might be more relevant now post. COVID. Uh, it will not address industry concerns, but then again, theatre is not only about industry concerns. Okay. Now, is there anyone else who has a question? I might let you, Elliot, control that. If anyone wants to wave, if they want to ask a question. I might, can I just say, I might also just add in, we were talking about um, community and buildings and institutions, and I think now more than ever, companies like ourselves as well as others that sit align us who are makers but own venues or run venues like you know there can't be any further denial now when we approach how we work with our audiences that it's not necessarily the show that stops people from coming to see the work it's the institution it's the accessibility it's um, the building itself you know it's it's even how we market work and how we speak to people and I think it would be really remiss of us to assume when we revert back into dreaming of a new future or whatever this normal is. There's brokenness in a lot of, of what all of us do and how this sector supports artists and audiences together. So now's a really great time to just really like unpack that and blow it up and speak to audiences just like we're speaking to artists. Like find out what it is that might stop them figure out what it is that they actually want. And I know that there's lots of people doing that good work, but um, we can't operate when we return in an echo chamber. That's, that's part of what is broken, I think. Yeah. Now, Melissa um, from Arts Nexus, you have a question, is that right? Yeah, look, I just want to pick up on what Dave was saying. I just wonder about the well-being of us practitioners that are holding it all together. We're so... Um, focused on audiences and how to bring our um, artists back in but our actual how do you keep going when your plan is changing day to day and you don't know how to what to ping that onto so yeah I'm just wondering about your personal well-being how you're managing with that Dave I think that's uh, <laughs> slow pause <laughs> slow pause look this has been a fucking ride um it has been treacherous um and one of the things i feel super proud about is knowing that when i get to get into this a space like this with other colleagues and arts workers that i'm talking with some of the most emotionally intelligent in tune um creative people around you know everyone that's you know, in this room and I've, I've had many catch-ups with creative friends who are like, you know what, we're all in this boat together. Um, I feel a sense of, I feel a deep sense of pride in our community and about that in the excellent, excellent humans we get to do this with. Um, so that's been one of, that's been one of my lifelines in terms of the business itself. I, um, probably daily, if not every couple of days, just question whether or not it's all worth it, um, whether or not I could be asked because um, I, um, you, never, you never get told from the top down that what you're doing is worth it, is valid. And by the top down, I mean like politically when we're told, when we're told day after day after day that we, we we won't support you any further with funding or support. You get you get reinforced that the thing that you're doing has no validity. <laughs> so, and then you turn into a group of people like this where you go, actually, it does have validity. We do put something out into the world. And it, it's hard to necessarily communicate 
um, the value of it when everything is measured in money. You mm -hmm. know, everything we do is measured in money. Money, money, how much is it worth? Like, um, and I guess, I guess it's just the constant battle. I would like for that battle to become slightly easier over time, but um, I, I just don't know um, how that works. Well, I think um, we have to come back to continue this conversation because it is 12.30. And I think um, just quickly that I think, you know, they always say the arts is resilient and they're adaptable and it's, uh, but I, I really believe this is the true, the true moment where we've all been training our whole lives to come together and sort this shit out. <laughs> and I can see that there's, there's enough incredible people that we are connected to as a network who believe in that we will survive this. And I think we still don't have the answers, but I think these conversations are crucial to find a way through this together. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks so much Soha and Dave. That was really um, honest. And I know these are really tough times. There's a lot of questions, a lot of great statements in, um, in the chat line. And also just letting you know that um, Frank Panucci is on tomorrow, but I think we should continue this conversation. I feel like we're just getting into some really deep uh, drilling into some really good stuff here right now, but thank you. I'm Beck Mack. Thanks so much to Norman, Sarah and Elliot and Melissa and the team for joining us and everyone else and take care everyone. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys.